Um, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a City of Northampton Board of Health meeting. It's January 19th, 2023. Time is 533. Um, tonight we have uh, all members of our board present. Dr. Cynthia Swopis, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Nurse Dallas Ducar, Janet Grant, and myself, Dr. Joanne Levin. We also have some uh, staff from the Department of Health, um, Director Amy Hutchins of the Department of Inv Environmental Health and Human Services. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll ask you later to introduce the other staff members. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, First, we'll start with a public comment session. Uh, we would, uh, we're always interested in hearing from the public. Uh, we ask that you limit your comments to two minutes. And um, Suzanne, are you up for being timer? Oh, you're muted. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, great. Um, and because of the way our Zoom is set up that the public doesn't generally have their videos enabled, um, we can't see you if you're waving. So for people who want to give public comment, please use your electronic hand, which is found in the reactions department down in your lower menu. So if you would like to give public comment, please raise an electronic hand. I don't see anyone. Let me give it one more minute. Anyone here for public comment? Okay, I don't see anyone here for public comment session. We'll close the public comment session. Um, then, um, would someone like to make a motion to uh, open to co convene the uh, meeting of the Northampton Board of Health? Move to open. Is there a second? Second. Any comment or discussion? All in favor, we'll do a roll call for votes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. And me? Yes. Okay. Board of Health meeting is now open. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, um, this uh, meeting is being recorded. Um, and um, I've already mentioned who's here. We are all here. Um, I'm just going to mention that um, I may need to leave early if we are going to go for an extended time. Um, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, so uh, the first thing on our agenda was a continuation of the hearing for Jim's Variety. Um, do we have a representative from Jim's Variety here? Amy, do you know if they were invited to come to the department? To, they uh, were, and we reached out to them to see if they'd like to join us at the, the department itself because they, they had some technical, technical difficulties last time, right. and they, they assured that they were going to be all set and that they, they would be here. Okay. Do you see any of these names represented? I, I, I don't. And the only... Right. The one thing is that it appears on the agenda that the hearing is to start at 545. Oh, that's a so, very good point. So good point. maybe we need to give them that time. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's move on and we'll come back to them. Let's move to public health nursing updates. Do you want to in introduce your staff, Amy? And yeah, go abs there? absolutely. Um, Kelly Hughes is with us tonight. She's our new public health nurse. Um, Kelly, if you'd like, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at DHHS? Hi there. Are, is everybody able to hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to mute myself because I'm hearing Oh, like you're a here repeat twice. of my voice. You're, you're, you're Can you hear me if I mute? You're you're here twice. Are you able to hear me if I do that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi. Sorry about that. So, um, my name is Kelly Hughes. I'm an LPN that's been working in ambulatory care, primary care in the Valley for about eight years or so, seven eight years. Um, I worked with the health department as part of the COVID nineteen. Uh, contact tracing nurse collaborative for a couple of years and that's how I got connected with the health department and I'm also an MRC volunteer from about 2016 
till now. Um, I'm excited to to join the team and uh, work with Amy and Elliot and Meredith and everybody else. Seems really lovely, and um, I'm excited to to start this new adventure. Great. Well, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Elliot's also with us. I think Elliot's going to do uh, an update on the respiratory illness. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm sharing straight from the um, Northampton City website where anyone who wants to can find this information every week. Um, so here's our dashboard um, for this week. Now, we, we had a pretty significant bump over the holidays, um, and I know last week um, our test positivity rate rose to 11%. So that was kind of worrying. But then um, when you dig into the numbers, it was actually for the week that included New Year's, and, um, and there were very few tests performed. Um, which I think just meant that the only tests that were being done basically were were probably through like hospitals and things like that, where they're they're testing people who are sicker. So I think that's why our test positivity rate temporarily like doubled for only a week. Um, our hospitalization rate in the county is about the same as it as it was, um, and our wastewater has had a huge decline. So um, that's all pretty good to see. Um, it seems like. Um, like we're probably coming down from our holiday peak, um, particularly based on the wastewater and the fact that our hospitalizations have stopped climbing. Um, although of course we know hospitalization lag um, cases, so um, they're still kind of high. So you can see our wastewater data here. The, um, the blue is Northampton, the green is Hampshire County, and uh, the gray is nationally. And, and you can see our, our local, our two local numbers here, they've declined quite a lot. Um, they're kind of back to almost pre-Thanksgiving levels. Um, and flu, luckily, seems to have collapsed. Um, where, I mean, if you look at it, we're really, we're back to a typical season. We're not, it's, flu's not gone, but it's, it's not at these like extremely high levels that we were seeing for a while. Um, which is great to see. Um, now, I know the experts are predicting that later in the season, most likely we're going to get a second spike of flu B. Um, it's hard to say how how like bad that'll be, but um, I know that that um, I was hearing from DPH that they are expecting a second spike later in the season for flu. And then we know RSV is still circulating, but at pretty low levels. So um, that also has quieted down. So all in all right now, it's it's um, it seems like cautiously good news um, for the time being in terms of respiratory illnesses. Um, and as always, people should use the same, uh, you know, techniques they've been using in terms of social distancing, masking, indoor ventilation, um, testing, staying home if they're sick, all of that. Um, Elliot, just a, um, the transmission rate, I'm sorry, the slide went by really quickly. We're still um, high with the transition mate, transmission rate. Yeah, so we are still at the high level. Um, okay. And our best indicator now because of PC, uh, our testing and, and home testing is wastewater. Is that correct? That was still it seems like it. And and um, the I just uh, was in a, a webinar with the CDC about wastewater today, and they were saying that um, wastewater has very um, very reliably predicted hospitalizations, and so um, they're seeing that it really is a pretty good indicator. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, what I see at the hospital also reflects what you were uh, saying. We had, and I don't remember which week it was, maybe the week after Christmas, we had an enormous jump in hospitalizations, like doubled, like wild, and then it went right back down. Um, so I'm not, you know, I think it was real, um, but, uh, but definitely in a better place than it was. Any questions for Elliot? Okay, thank you so much. All right, I think we'll go back to uh, our hearing. Um, Amy, do you remember, do we need to officially open and close the hearing? Does anybody remember? 
I, I, I'm going to think we do do that. I, I feel like we do. I don't know that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, it would be safer to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, uh, oh, there's Hamid. Do you want to um, let Mr. Habib um, be a co-host? You got it. Okay, where is he? Mr. Habib, are you with us? Hi, um, yes, hi, how are you today? Good, welcome. Do you want to turn on your video? You don't have to, yeah. obviously, okay. uh, but you are welcome to if you want to. Um, <laughs> there you are. Okay, great. Um, so would someone like to make a motion to uh, open the hearing? uh regarding jim's variety store i'll motion is there a second second thank you any discussion all in favor suzanne yes dallas yes janet yes cynthia yes joanne yes okay um welcome back mr habib thank you thank you so much um so uh the last time we met we had talked about um, um, the findings um, and um, we had talked about the fact that um, <clears throat> we were using the new state regulations um, and that we had proposed uh, the fine of $1,000, but we were undecided about uh, what uh, is appropriate for um, for the ban, ban on sales. Um, Meredith, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight, um, but her recommendation is that um, because they cited um, Rule 665, which is the state reg, um, that we couldn't use our local reg. And then there was the whole issue about the state regs sort of because they were new, everyone was sort of starting fresh. Um, there was a, a question that Meredith had at that time um, about whether there was a mandatory um, ban on sales um, in the state reg, but we discovered later that that was only true if sales to a minor was the issue, which was not the issue here. Um, so Meredith's recommendation is that we go with that fine and not with the um, sales ban and uh, complete this uh, case. Does anybody have any, any comments? And Cheryl, welcome. Um, Cheryl Sabar is Thank with you. us. Thank <laughs> you. I had a hard time getting on. What's new? <laughs> <laughs> So Cheryl, maybe I'll ask you to introduce yourself. So uh, we have some new members and maybe we'll go around and introduce ourselves because in case, because of this hearing, there may be questions for you. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. sure. Um, I am Cheryl Sabara. I am the executive director and senior staff attorney for the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards. And in that capacity, I provide legal education and technical assistance to boards of health throughout the Commonwealth. I think what, what occurred here is that um, the state law now requires a suspension for, if, if for the first offense of selling to someone under the age of 21. Um, but that is the only mandatory suspension requirement in the state law for a first sale. And I believe that's why Meredith um, is suggesting that the fine um, alone would suffice in this case. Any questions for Mr. Habib, for me, or for Cheryl? Um, I, I guess I kind of have a question, although I don't know who it's for. I just, um, pretty new to the Board of Health, and this was the first thing like this that has come up. Uh, I remember uh, Meredith saying that this actually had not been a first offense. 
So, and, and I don't know how that's counted or, you know, I think it was maybe it was a first offense since these new regs, but it's not overall the first offense. So I find that a little concerning. Um, I can give a little explanation of that if, um, if I'm allowed to. Sure, go ahead. So I, um, I'm managing this store since last 10 years. Uh, currently, the um, I was actually going through the state rules and regulations that uh, if you have a violation and then for the next three years, you know, you do not have any more violation, then the previous one gets um, expunged from your record. So if after three years, you have a new offense, new violation, then uh, that is considered as the first one. Um, so far in, in 10 years, we never had any state related uh, violations. Uh, for the city of Northampton, uh, we did had two violations before, but um, that also been a very, very long time ago. Our first violation was about eight years ago. It was selling to a minor at that time. We had a new ploy and uh, same thing happened. Uh, it's almost four years now since our last violation. So um, as far as anything else is concerned, this is our, our, our first violation on not selling um, to a minor. Yeah. Um, so I've just a point of clarification is that we have local regulations which are slightly different from the state ones and ours tend to be more strict. And so our regulations say that um, there is no what they call tolling period, meaning you get to wipe your slate clean after three years, even though the state offers that. Our regulations don't, and that is something on our agenda tonight to, to discuss going forward. Um, but um, because, uh, Cheryl, tell me if I'm correct, because ours are more strict, we can go by ours. Um, uh, yes, you can. That the state law specifies that if the local regulation is stricter, then this, then you certainly can use your own regulation. Um, and I'd like to add, Donna Bowman, Inspector Bowman, is here with us, who did the inspection and has the the file for Jim's Variety. So I, I'm not sure if you'd like her to speak to um, the history as well and. Um, that, that side to it. If you guys have any questions regarding that, Donna is here um, with us. Sure, Donna, do you have anything you wanna add? I think we reviewed the specifics last time, but I don't know if you wanna summarize them. Thank you for coming. Sure, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. I don't have anything to add. I know we've, we've, we have reviewed uh, everything that was on the, um, the violation list. Uh, there's nothing new or, 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 or different um, to be reviewed. Um, so there, um, I don't have anything else to offer with, with, with uh, more news. Um, um, thank you. Cheryl, just the one question is, I guess Meredith had recommended that, or, or said that the state had recommended that everybody get a clean slate because these new regs came in and we had sort of old regs and new regs. And, and how, how do you recommend we approach that? Well, I, I, that is the recommendation normally given because of the different tolling periods, because the effective date of the regulation was during COVID um, and boards weren't out actually enforcing for some time. And um, what the standard operating procedure at most boards was to start new with the 36 months. Um, however, with, with Northampton, because you don't have a tolling period at all, um, the, the tolling period really isn't the issue. The issue is how do you want to continue, do you want to wipe out the old ones just because of the new law or do you want to keep them in? And that's a, a judgment call that the board needs to make. Yeah, Meredith's recommendation is um, to let everyone start fresh, um, but that's up to up to you guys. Any thoughts? But that does that impact 
this particular case? I mean, or is that another discussion? Well, because there, because uh, Mr. Habib is is acknowledging, I don't have the data in front of me that this is this third offense. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would impact this discussion if we decided not to. Uh, if we decided not to let him start fresh and have this be his first offense, then we'd have to look at our regs what the um, consequences are for a third offense. If, if I'm reading the letter correctly that was sent to um, Mr. Hadid, it's listed as a first violation. That, that, oh. is, that is what we notified him about. So I would think that it would not be right at this point to change that. Oh, actually, the uh, the law that was cited was the state law. So this was the first offense under the state law. Okay. Um, okay. But but it was it, that is what how he was notified. Mm -hmm. So this would be I don't think that this would be an opportune time to um, change that to a second or third offense. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any other questions or thoughts or would someone like to make a proposal? May I just say, I'm, I apologize, but may I just say one other thing um, that I always say, and again, this is something for the board to consider, but what public health is, what, what we, we try to do in public health is to get to compliance. We're not about punishment, we're about compliance. That's the goal of everything that we do. So I just want that to be out on the table in public. Um, can I add something on, on that part? Um, we, um, we have the tobacco as well as beer and wine in our store. And uh, we have some, uh, you know, strong rules and regulations in the store as well, as far as, you know, checking IDs and making sure that uh, none of the minors in our community are getting uh, what they're not supposed to get. Uh, beer and wine, you know, you as everybody knows, is required to have at least 21 and over. Uh, we have zero violations in the history of this store. Uh, for the tobacco, yes, we had two uh, selling to minor one eight years ago, one four years ago. Uh, again, it's 100% agree that should not have happened. But um, when an employee changes, we, you know, get a new employee sometime. It, does get a little difficult, but then I also understand that is our problem just to make sure that we have everything in place to train new employees better. Um, so as, as far as compliance is concerned, we we have a very strict rules and regulations and we'll, if I have to make those stricter, I, I will do anything to make sure that, you know, uh, these mistakes won't happen in the, the future. We appreciate that. You know, we take these regulations quite seriously. I um, myself have uh, I myself have a 15 year old and a nine year old and I definitely understand that how our community, you know, people feel if their kids, you know, either uh, smoke in or, you know, uh, drink in under the age of 21, then I, I completely understand that being father myself. So I um, am doing it plus further I'll do anything in my, uh, my hands to make sure that these violations don't happen again. Great. Um, board members, anybody uh, have a, any other questions? Or would someone like to um, make a motion? Uh, I move to impose the $1,000 fine for this violation of our tobacco regulations and the fine only. A second. Any other comments, discussion, questions? I mean, I think actually procedurally we had already done that. We had already I think we talked about it, but I think we didn't vote. That's what Meredith said. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I thought we had separated the fine from the suspension. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, Mr. Habib. Thank you so and, much. Um,
Wishing you good luck in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Uh, would someone like to close the hearing? Move Motion to, to go ahead. Go ahead, Cynthia. <laughs> Motion to close the hearing. Thanks, Suzanne. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all. I um I actually do have one comment. Just um, listening to what Mr. Habib said about you know wanting to do anything he can to try to make sure that it doesn't happen, particularly sales to minors. And I just I just really want to emphasize the idea of training new employees, um, making them feel what you feel as a father of young, you know, of young people <laughs> and yes. yeah and then and then periodically checking in with them about it i i 100 agree with that i'm already have started that in fact uh sometime i use my family members or friends that my employees haven't seen i send them in the store hey try to go you know uh <laughs> other day i send my niece who's uh 17 years old and i sent her that hey try to go buy a cigarette let's see what happens and I'm glad that, you know, it wasn't compliant. So I'm doing stuff like that as well, just to make sure that, you know, um, we are there. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Habib, if you could turn off your, if you could mute and turn off your video, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, is robin here robin's here amy can you unmute robin and rachel please um our next business is uh discussing racism at the community gardens and we have um robin McEwen and rachel ehrlich with us um to present. You have documents you've received uh, regarding this, uh, both a letter that they sent to the board in December, as well as a statement um, that they proposed that um, they're looking for our endorsement. Um, so Robin and Rachel, you may take it away. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Levin, members of the board, for having us tonight to discuss the racial equity initiative at the Community Garden in Northampton. I'm joined by several community gardeners and community members who are involved in this effort, including, I believe, Ellie Cook, as well as Rachel Ehrlich. Ellie and Rachel and I are the three co-signers of the letter submitted to the board last month describing the initiative, its proposal, and the request that the board endorse the proposal. So I'm going to turn it over here to Rachel to present a summary of the initiative, the proposal, and our request to the board. And following that, we're all available to address any questions you may have. Amy, could you also um, give Ellie, um, um, make her co-host so she can put on her video and unmute. Is Ellie, oh, is Ellie the, oh, there we go. The E, yeah. And I see Robin, where is Rachel? I am right here. Peace okay. to meet you. There you are. Can everyone hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Good. Um, good, good evening, Chair Levin and other members of um, the Board of Health. We're really happy to be here. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to hear from us tonight about the Racial Equity Initiative at the Northampton Community Garden. Um, I'm Rachel Ehrlich. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a gardener at the Community Garden and part of a group of gardeners that have been working on this initiative. Um, I'm going to present tonight a brief summary of the initiative, its nexus to public health, health and our request for the board's endorsement of our proposal. The Northampton Community Garden is located on Burt's Pit Road. It offers 420 garden plots, gardened by over 250 gardeners. It's a program of the Parks and Recreation Department and is managed by a volunteer garden committee and maintained by a community of gardeners. In recent years, Multiple black gardeners have left the community gardens because of failures to address concerns of racial bias. And both past and present black gardeners and other gardeners of color continue to report acts of bias and racism in our garden community. 
recognizing the need to address the impacts of racial bias and related issues of safety, access, equity, and dignity on our community, a growing group of gardeners has been working for the past year and a half to ask that the Northampton Community Garden address these issues in both its policies and its practices. This group of gardeners has developed a proposed equity and sustainability statement, which you have for adoption by the community garden. You've seen this statement and accompanying FAQs. Um, they were submitted to the board last month as, a, as attachments to the letter that we sent. The proposed statement articulates both an explicit commitment to addressing racial equity and importantly establishes a framework for development by the community gardeners of a plan of action. The group's proposal specifically asks that the Northampton Community Garden, one, adopt this equity and sustainability statement, and two, create a dedicated committee position on the garden committee for a volunteer representative to coordinate implementation of specific actions in support of this initiative. Similar initiatives undertaken by other community gardens have resulted in a range of actions, including implementation of frameworks to address equity, and access in the assignment of garden plots, development of safety protocols that reflect alternatives to increase police presence, providing educational resources to gardeners, and partnering with local organizations to help amplify and enhance the effectiveness of this work. Um, I want to briefly now summarize the outreach that we've conducted to date. Um, over the past year and a half, this initiative has included outreach to the Parks and Recreation Department, the Garden Committee, gardeners and neighbors to the garden, um, community members and city representatives. The Garden Committee and Parks and Recreation have in the past indicated that they don't have the expertise or capacity to address these issues. And while we have deep respect for their work, we also believe that making real progress on an existing municipal commitment to issues of safety, equity and dignity cannot be further delayed. And we. So we continue our efforts while we look forward to a future opportunity to work with the Garden Committee and the Parks and Recreation um, toward these goals. In the meantime, this past August, we, be we began additional outreach to gardeners to share the proposal. And despite starting somewhat late in the gardening season, over 20% of gardeners have been already reached and signed on to support of the proposal. This fall and into the winter, we've continued a series of informal conversations with community members and city representatives to familiarize themselves with them with the initiative. The responses to all of this outreach has been really overwhelmingly positive and supportive. Finally, and I know, thank you so much for continuing to listen. I know I've been talking for a bit. I want to address the nexus to public health. As all of you are aware, the social conditions in the environments where we live, learn, work, and recreate affect our health and our quality of life. Racism and racial bias in these environments correlate to significant measurable negative health outcomes. Understanding this, both the City Council and the Board of Health have adopted resolutions that explicitly identify racism as an ongoing public health crisis, identify action at the local level as essential, and importantly, commit to ongoing action to address this public health crisis. As you know, the Board of Health's 2020 resolution declaring racism a public health emergency acknowledged that the ongoing public health crisis of racism results in health disparities and unequal access. And for those reasons, the board resolved to commit to ongoing work around racial justice. In that context, endorsement of our proposal is aligned with the City Council and the Board of Health's resolutions and re represents a small but real step toward the stated commitment to address the public health crisis of racism in our community. Underscoring this, the racial equity in initiative underway at the Community Garden has been presented to the Northampton Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Commission um, has voted to endorse the proposal. Finally, in closing, um, we're heartened to know that both the City Council and the Board of Health have explicitly committed to addressing racial equity and racial disparities as a public health concern. In keeping with this commitment, we're here tonight to request that the Board of Health stand with the Northampton Human Rights Commission and endorse the proposal that the Northampton Community Garden adopt the equity and sustainability statement with its embedded framework for action and create a dedicated position on the Garden Committee for a volunteer representative to coordinate implementation of this necessary work. Should the board vote to endorse this proposal, we ask that the board consider summarizing its endorsement in a brief written statement or titled letter. 
I want to end by thanking you all for your time and note that there are several of us here tonight who would be happy to answer questions. Thank you again so much for listening. Thank you so much. Um, board members, does anybody have any questions? We've got um, Rachel, Robin, and Ellie here representing um, folks from the garden. Any questions? Uh, you should have received the uh, a copy of the letter as well as the statement that they're asking uh, for us to endorse. Um, any questions, comments? Um, I have two questions. Um, as we move forward to try to help address racism as a public health issue, information about what's going on would be very helpful to me. So acknowledging that you've said that there have been events, it would help me to know the nature of these, um, the context in which they occurred. Um, that would just help me on a personal level. And this, my second question is, how will our support help your efforts? Those are excellent questions. Thank you so much. Um, Robin, I'm gonna ask you to unmute if it's okay so we can address this together. Um, Robin, would you start by detailing just, uh, so first of all, I wanna say, Chris, thank you so much for your question. Um, we're not in a position obviously to detail all of the events that have been experienced by black gardeners or gardeners of color, um, but we're happy to enumerate an example of the kinds of things that we have heard. Um, Robin, would you take that and then I'll answer the second part of Chris's question. Sure, I'm, I'm aware from conversations with gardeners of color of a range of experiences. And I'll just start with my own experience as a white gardener. I've been a gardener for over 10 years. I've spent a lot of time in the garden and I have never once been questioned as to whether I belong there um, when I'm gardening or walking through the garden. Um, the most common story that I've heard is um, the the level of interrogation that gardeners of color experience over time the, the questioning about whether they belong um what are they doing in the, in in that plot is it their plot um those types of interactions there was a an event um a little over a year and a half ago that spurred on this current work um a a young uh, black child was verbally assaulted and accused of theft um, and that event, um, in combination with others, led to multiple Black gardeners leaving the garden, um, feeling that there was a failure to address um, both what had transpired in that event and, and the larger issue of, of racial bias and, and white privilege and how all of these things play out in a majority white space, which is um, what this community garden is. Um, I, Each of the gardeners of color, past and present, that I have spoken with have had their own story to tell about an experience. Um, and, you know, as Rachel said, it's, it's not my place really to, um, I think, go much further into their stories and, and their experiences in the garden. Um, but to say that um, these are the stories we hear all over our country, right? Um, coming out of majority white spaces, I don't think there's, I don't think we're an outlier um, in the community garden. Um, but I think that as with, um, the rest of our, our community and our communities across this country, we, we do need to acknowledge that these things are happening and we need to act. So I hope that answers enough of your question, Chris, um, yeah, regarding the, the nature I, and context. I, I apologize, that's the wrong name. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it, I'm Suzanne. Oh, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, you, I'm so you, sorry you, too, sorry about that, Suzanne. You have no way of knowing, <laughs> how would you know? <laughs> It has to be changed at the beginning of the meeting and skip right past that. Um, that's very helpful to me. Um, in reading through the materials, I, rec I recognize you need to um, honor people's privacy and um, not trigger people by having their particular stories um, spoken about in public without their consent. Uh, but. I had no idea the nature of what you were referring to. So what, what you have said is, is was very helpful. Rachel, did um, you want to answer that second question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to answer the second question. Um, change around um, equity work um, 
specifically around racism in this country and in our community is slow. Um, and the endorsement of um, your body in particular in relation to issues of public health um, and emphasizing that this is a public health issue amplifies this issue in the community. And that is necessary in order for us to continue to spur change. Um, we're trying to put some pressure to move and also create some collaborative bodies that will help us continue to do this work. Um, Robin, did you wanna add anything else to the second part of that question? No, that's, that's perfect, Rachel. So I have some questions. Um, my, you know, I don't know a whole lot about the garden. I'm not a gardener, uh, but I live very close by and walk through there. Uh, and my understanding is that the garden committee itself is all volunteer. So I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, honestly, to me, this is a little bit of a no brainer in, in terms of what you're asking, but I'm wondering why it, I, I understand the second part about getting the endorsement from the board of health, but I'm wondering why the garden committee just hasn't said, sure, if you want to have a representative, great. Um, so, so that's a question, I guess. I know they're all very hardworking volunteers um, with good intent, but so that's a question. Um, I'm wondering if there are any black or brown people that are part of your group um thinking about the whole thing of nothing about us without us it feels a little funny to me if everybody in your group is our white people who are saying this is what kind of needs to happen so there's that and i guess the third thing is just around governance in general of the garden committee is there a, a decision making process for how things happen there. What is the governance so that this could move forward? If you don't mind, I'm going to take your questions a little bit out of order and speak <laughs> to first the fact that we are a, a group of white people, although I will say that some gardeners of color have signed on to our initiative. But as a as a body of people who's been working together, we are a group of white people. Um, in no way would we ever presume to speak for or stand in the way of any initiative brought to the garden by people of color. And I firmly believe that this is a white problem that exists in the community garden and it's time for white people to step up and respond to that problem so that people of color can go about the business of gardening in the garden in a safe and thoughtful and, it, and in a way that in which they feel um, welcomed and white people have not created that. So I, I agree with what you said, um, you know, nothing, nothing um, for us without us. I think that that is excellent. And I also um, believe that it's time for white people to do this work. Um, I will say that at one point in the process, shortly after um, the incident that Robin mentioned, we were offered um, to take a seat on the garden committee um, to speak to issues um, of racism and racial equity. Um, and that offer was retracted. Um, and we don't really know why that is. Um, the only thing we've heard with regard to why the garden has, the garden <coughs> committee has not been able to work with us um, is a response about capacity and timing. Um, and I think Robin can speak a little bit more to some of the opaqueness of how the garden committee works. Um, well, my answer to the question about governance structure and how it works is that I, I don't I don't know. Um, I I have the same questions I think that you do. Um, I know some of the members of the committee, though I'm not aware of who all of them are. We have um, throughout the process of doing this work reached out a number of times to the committee to share our concerns, to share our suggestions, to share our interest, um, to provide updates. But uh, the response we've received is that 
Um, at one point, it was that they didn't have the expertise to discuss the issue. At another point, it was that they didn't have time to meet with us. So I, 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 um, I don't know enough about the governance structure or how committee members are selected or how decisions are made to, to answer that question. And I apologize about that. Mm. I wish I did. I, would like I just want to. Oh, could I say something, Rachel? Or are you? Okay. Um, thing number one, it's very opaque. The whole governance governance of the garden committee is opaque. There are a couple of people who seem to be running everything and they get a lot of work done and they're very effective in the actual work of the garden in terms of, you know, getting the hay, the straw to be delivered and the compost and all that and to uh, get people to do some garden work. But I would also like to point out that we have very few black gardeners or brown ones either. And I think that a lot of that is because quite a few of them have left. And um, the one, I've spoken to a couple of the black gardeners who are actually more than a couple, the brown gardeners just aren't interested in getting involved in this. They just don't want to. And I spoke to one black gardener and he said he just, he just was like, no, because he was, I think he was afraid, but I don't know that. I've also seen, I've witnessed evidence of this kind of uh, challenging people of color who come to the garden for some reason or another, and they're asked why they're there. And I've seen that happen twice in my time there which I'm sure it's happened more often. And we do have one black gardener who thought about leaving when everybody else left, but she decided to stay. And she uh, has a beautiful garden, amazing garden. And she, and so does the gentleman who didn't want to be involved. And she, and there aren't that many, there just aren't that many black people. There are quite a few, uh, there's like a, a a large contingent of Guatemalan gardeners, formerly Guatemalan, now American gardeners who are really prolific gardeners, wonderful gardeners, but they are not just not interested in all the the ins and outs of our discussion. So that's my have been my experience. And I walked around asking people to sign. So I I've, I've had a lot of experience just trying to figure out who who was interested and who wasn't or who was afraid and i felt fear you know from the man and from the woman she's willing to join on and i'm pretty sure she will be part of this group our group uh, very soon so uh other than that i mean i i think i know of only one other black gardener besides those two i mentioned and there may be more but this this is the problem we're not we're not making it accessible. We're not bringing people in. And so if we're not bringing people in and people have left, it gets wider and wider and wider, you know? Okay, so that's really all I had to say, I'm sorry. Thanks, Ellie. Um, is it true that the garden falls under Parks and Recreation? That is correct. It's a program of the Department of Parks and Rec. And have you approached them at all about how what what the governance structure is and how one gets on the garden committee and that kind of thing? We all of the conversation that we have had about um, our work has been transmitted both to the garden committee and to the Parks and Rec Commissioner. Actually, director director of the department. Sorry, and the, the director of the Department of Rex. And again, the response back has been. Um, minimal at best. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board members? I'd just like to comment that um, the city has a, um, a gem with the community garden, um, this beautiful piece of land. Um, and I just want to harken back to some work um, what Grow Food Northampton does, not owned by the city, but on city property, and um, how they outreach to several populations, um, equating food and justice and health as all the same thing. And um, for their plots and their land, the process is completely transparent. As a matter of fact, it's on a, on a sliding scale. And um, land is often donated to gardeners of color. 
and gardeners of color that may not even know how to farm or garden are taught that. And so we have an example in the community. Um, it's nonprofit. And I just think we have so much potential to do the same thing in the city's community garden. And I just wanna harken back to the city council's resolution, similar to our resolution. Um, the city council said in 2020 that they were going to um, establish a department of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, they never have. Um, and so the human rights commission is kind of carrying that. Um, and with, with very little authority. And um, we too adopted um, a, a resolution saying linking um, racism uh, to, to health. And so I think we have an opportunity here. So um, I hope uh, we can endorse this, uh, the, um, the recommendations and also perhaps write a letter of support. I'm gonna share, um... See if I can share my screen and I'll just put up the proposed language. Um, let's see if this works. Um, does that work? Okay. Um, so this is the statement that um, the garden committee, that you guys are looking for us to endorse, and we would put it in a, a letter form. Um, Joanne, may I add one thing? Mm -hmm. um, that just to clarify the proposal that we would be looking for you to endorse as is essentially two parts. One is um, adoption of the statement, and the mm -hmm. second is creation of a dedicated seat on the garden committee to essentially lead, facilitate implementation of the effort. So there's the two parts to the proposal. Well, I think as part of the, in the role of Board of Health, we can choose to adopt a statement, but I mean, I think we could support the idea of a dedicated position on the garden committee, but obviously we don't have authority over that. Mm -hmm. um, my thought was simply um, endorsement of our proposal. Of course, you don't have authority to enact any of those things, right? Right. Um, any any other comments? Does anyone want to make a motion? I think you're. Um, your work is certainly in line with the uh, statement statement that we uh, uh, put together a couple of years ago about um, racial disparity and health and how they're intertwined. Um, would anyone like to make a uh, a motion? I'm I move that the uh, Board of Health adopt. Um, and support the resolution that was presented to us by the uh, what's called the Community Garden Committee, and perhaps write a formal endorsement as well. So you're proposing adopting that statement or, or um, acknowledging that statement and uh, supporting the dedicated position on the Garden Committee, both parts? Yes. With a letter. Did that affect? Yes. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> uh, is there a second for that? I second it. Thank you, Dallas. Um, any other discussion? I, I guess I just I I just wish we had a little more information from the garden committee itself or the parks and rec like because i i just don't understand why with with the explanation that that this group has been given which is not really an explanation um i i feel I don't know if if there's something if we're going to do this if we can also in our letter make a statement about how we the, I mean all the all the 
boards, everything's in, interconnected in an effort to be a healthy community. So we would want to see, I, 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 the, like the Parks and Rec Committee be involved in this. Do you want to make an amendment to Cynthia's uh, proposal that asks for Parks and Recs to have, have transparency? Well, around, I guess uh, I'd like to know what other something? board members think of that idea. I, I just think that um, asking Parks and Rec to come to to the Board of Health meeting on this particular issue, um, I, I think I have to trust the present the presenters having gone to the Parks and Rec um, Commission, and also I think you all went to, to their meetings, right, and made statements. Have you done that? Um, just to clarify. So I can address that. Our our anticipated um, next step. I mean, we've been making our choices about who we've spoken with and who we've presented to based on um, really support and recommendations we've been receiving from um, individuals and representatives throughout the city. Um, I, I anticipate our next stop is to go back to Parks and Rec to the commission. Um, we were hoping to be added to their agenda. I'm not sure that that's going to happen. So I expect our next stop will be public comment um, at a Parks and Rec commission meeting. Oh. Um, one of the and so to be able to appear there with the same message we provided to you and to indicate support from both the Human, Human Rights Commission and Board of Health um, would be um, powerful, I think. But that that is our anticipated next stop, if that helps um, fill in yeah. some of that. That's good. Yeah, I, I mean, and I think that that's appropriate. Um, absolutely more appropriate than perhaps us calling in or calling out Parks and Recs at, at this point. Yeah, no, I wasn't suggesting that we do that. I just was trying to figure out how we do understand them, mm -hmm. understand what is the perspective. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Uh, it, it might be useful to hear, and I'm sorry that I didn't mention this earlier, and I know that you're in the middle of a vote, that. Um, the outreach to the garden committee when black gardeners left the garden was significant. Um, several gardeners wrote letters, several garden neighbors wrote letters. Um, there was. Oh, we've lost you. Oh, we lost you for a minute, Rachel. Are you back? I'm back. I'm back. Um, can you, did you hear the part that I said that after several black gardeners left the garden? So let me reiterate after several black gardeners left the garden, there was um, tremendous outreach from gardeners and garden neighbors to the garden committee um, to, to say this is a problem. And there was no response to any of those. So um, Janet, your, um, I share in your being confounded about the lack of responsiveness. Um, the only thing that we have been told is that it's a capacity and timing issue. We haven't heard anything else. Dallas? Yeah, thank you. Um, to me, this feels, you know, while it's important to know the context and important to know what, you know, how Parks and Rec and others may have responded or not, or the, the garden committee, the proposal on the table around the equity and sustainable statement in advancing racial equity and enhancing the health of the natural environment. I mean, that seems like something that would be in line of what we voted before as a board in our philosophy in general. And so regardless of how others may have reacted to this, it seems like the proposal on the table is in line with what um, our mission generally, right? Thank you. Any other comments? We do have a proposal on the table. Any other discussion? Comments? Board members? Um, Cynthia, do you want to um, restate your 
<laughs> is that too hard? <laughs> um, I think you wanted to adopt uh, the proposal, which was two parts, adopt the statement and um, um, support the their interest in a dedicated position on the garden committee. And we would put that information in a letter. Was that your uh, proposal? That's well said for the, for the uh, <laughs> motion. Thank you. <laughs> Point of clarification, letter to whom? I, I mean, I, I'm just thinking here, I would uh, recommend the director of parks and recreation um, and also perhaps the mayor. Um, I was going to say parks, recreation, the mayor and city council. I mean, this should be yeah. sort of. It's my understanding that some city councilors are involved in this initiative. Robin or Rachel, can you verify that or have been made aware of this issue? There are a number of city councilors who've been made, made aware of the issue, whom we've had informal conversations with. Um, those that I'm aware of have all expressed strong, strong support. Um, I believe there are still a handful who, whom we may not have yet had um, conversations with, but um, I believe the majority is aware of this um, initiative. All right, any other questions or comments? You're ready for a vote. I'm gonna go around my screen, Suzanne. Yes. Uh, Cynthia? Yes. Janet? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your hard work. We appreciate your coming and we appreciate all that you have done. Um, you've taken a lot of time and got a lot of people to, uh, to do this work. Um, so thank you. Thank we will, you. Thank you we will, so much. Get, we will formalize so that and uh, and get a copy of that to you. Thank you so much to all of you. We really appreciate your time and um, engagement and support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, I apologize to the uh, other people on our agenda for having uh, to wait around, but we're moving along. Um, uh, Amy, do you want to introduce Kiko? Hi, Kiko. Uh, welcome. If you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and what you do at DHHS. Thanks, Amy. And hello, everyone. Thank you, Chair Levin and everyone for having me this evening. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Kiko Mallon, and I am the Prevention Team Director for the City of Northampton Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm grateful to Commissioner O'Leary for making some time on the agenda for me today. Um, I, I, I actually don't, I would love to learn more about all of you and what you do. I've met Dallas before, but everyone else I don't know. Um, but my, I guess my goal here is just to tell you a little bit about myself and and what I do um, at DHHS. And I don't know how much background you all have about this work. So I'm just gonna try to give a high level in overview. And if there are questions, please please feel free to jump in. Um, but just a little bit about myself. I am a seasoned public health professional. I've been doing public health work for, wow, more than three decades. I'm a Massachusetts native. I grew up in the Boston area, but I moved out West in the late eighties and I, my first public health job was working for a feminist women's health center in Portland, Oregon. We were an abortion provider. And so I, I cut my public health teeth on public health activism, women's health, and, you know, being on the front lines of a very controversial line of work. Um, from there, did lots of other things, ended up in California when I did my master's in public health at UC Berkeley and also social work. I have a dual degree. Um, I came back to, to the East Coast, actually, after that, and I was in Vermont for a while um, running a startup nonprofit called Grounds for Health, which is still in existence today that was founded by Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and a couple of other coffee companies in Vermont to provide healthcare services to women in coffee growing communities. Um, so that was a wonderful, I really loved being back in New England. California called me back. I went back for another almost two decades and I'm now back in Massachusetts um, because my mother is getting older and felt the need to be closer by. So I'm actually living in a big house with my husband, my father-in-law and my mother, um, which has been interesting. And uh, in doing, making this huge plan to come to Western Mass, I was so fortunate to meet Meredith and to be able to find this job that I'm now um, 
loving um, at the Department of Health and Human Services. So my background really is in maternal child health. Most of the work that I've done is women's health, maternal child health. I'm learning about substance misuse prevention, substance use prevention. That's the work that our prevention team does. But my knowledge of public health principles, my commitment to racial equity, this last conversation is very much in line with so much of the work that I've done in public health. My last job was working for Alameda County Public Health Department, which has a pretty good national reputation for being on the cutting edge of understanding that public health is social justice and that racial justice is integral to ensuring the health of all members of our community, um, that no one is free when others are oppressed. And this is a, certainly an ideology that I embody in all of my work and getting to know the demographics here in Western Mass, which are very different from those of Oakland, California, I think you can probably imagine. So that's been a shift. A big part of my work in the past has been looking at the disparate rates of infant mortality, that black babies die at two to three times the rate of white babies, black mamas died at three to four times the rates of white mamas, and how this is something that is a result of structural racism and can only be addressed by dismantling structural racism. So this is the sort of the viewpoint that I bring into my work. Um, what I do at the Department of Health and Human Services is I have five staff who report to me. Um, one of them is the Hampshire Hope Coalition Coordinator. So Hampshire Hope is our coalition that was founded, I believe, in 2015 to address the opioid epidemic, a multi, um, you know, a multidisciplinary, very diverse stakeholder organization that's been doing incredible work engaging people in the community to understand how we could work together to reduce um, deaths from op opioid overdoses. Um, and out of that program, so the Hampshire Hope coordinator is a fairly new person named Taylor McAndrew, who's been on the job for about six months. She reports to me and is beginning to think deeply with the coalition about the opioid settlement funds and how those can be used to address um, this ongoing issue in our community and to really center the voices of people who use drugs and their families and understanding the best way to spend that money, which was people who were hurt by what happened in the opioid industry are the ones who should be helping us to figure out how to spend those funds. So excited about that work that she'll be thinking about. Um, out of Hampshire Hope came a program called the Drug Addiction Recovery Team or DART, which is fairly well known in Northampton. Um, we've expanded from Northampton out into many communities in Hampshire County, as well as Hamden County and Berkshire County. Um, the Drug Addiction Recovery Team is a post-opioid overdose outreach effort. So we work with first responders, law enforcement, EMS, fire. It varies from community to community. The people who are responding to the scene of an overdose and helping to get that person the attention that he or she or they might need. Um, so really very client-centered. Um, the referral is made into our system. And then we, we connect that person with a recovery coach who can really understand what that person's goals are. Um, harm reduction focused, really just, it's about saving lives. It's not necessarily about getting people to detox or mandating recovery. It's about understanding what's going on with folks and connecting them to those resources that they most need to be the healthiest they can be. That program is an amazing program that is um, going through lots of changes now as we expand. And we have also two new staff, our two DART coordinators who report to me who are doing this work and getting to know them and how, getting to know our partners and understanding how we can strengthen and further expand the DART program has been really interesting for me in these last six months that I've been on the job. Um, we also have uh, Kara McLaughlin, who is the Northampton Prevention Coalition coordinator. So that's our primary um, prevention coalition. So substance use prevention. She works mostly with youth um, in the Northampton public school system, primarily in the high school, but is also engaged with elementary um, school staff and students as well as the middle school. And Kara is also somebody who is really a champion for racial justice and racial equity in our community and the and involving um, young people. So again, nothing about us without us really wanting to have much more authentic youth engagement on the coalition and to encourage everyone to think about our, our, our privilege as um, white people. Many of us in this work are white people. Um, I'm used to working in an environment that's much more diverse. And so I think we're all really thinking about what that means and how we can diversify our workforce. And Kara is certainly at the forefront of that conversation. And then finally, I work also with Melissa Aloisi, who is a brilliant technology manager who is helping us to think about our um, database infrastructure and um, a, a burgeoning health information exchange data repository that will be a place where we can um, sort of collect data sets, data sets of publicly available de-identified data related to opioid overdose, but also other public health concerns that the public can access. So we're working on 
building that. It's a ways off, um, but she is the person championing that and is really doing a wonderful job. I didn't mention the names of the two DART coordinators. They are Kathy Catunio and um, Kate Shapiro. So I think that's kind of the high level of what I do. I also have some responsibility for the Public Health Excellence Grant, which I think some of you may be familiar with, which is really about regional um, infrastructure building for public health in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and in um, Western Mass where we have fewer public health resources compared to the Eastern part of the state. Um, so really thinking about how we can share our expertise in the city of Northampton to help smaller boards of health um, be able to meet the public health needs in their communities. So I do some administrative responsibilities related to that grant. I know I'm a fast talker, it's something that East Coast people are a little bit more open to than West Coast people, but I hope I didn't overwhelm you with too much information. And that was fairly clear and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, that was very clear and very comprehensive and welcome. Thank you, uh, really good. Board members, any questions? And do we put, so say your name, Kiko? It's Kiko, yeah, Kiko Mallon. Questions, comments? Not a question, just so happy you're here. This is gonna be great to work with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's wonderful to meet all of you and to be, to listen to this conversation today. I really appreciated all of your thoughts about these issues. Thank you for coming. Sure. Thanks, Kiko. Oh, I forgot one thing. Could I, if I just could have one more minute, which is that February is Black History Month. Wow. And I was chatting with Meredith about what we might do as a Department of Health and Human Services to recognize that. Um, thinking about it's an opportunity to obviously reinvigorate our commitment to racial justice, but it's also really an opportunity to celebrate Black excellence, Black joy. Um, and so what is it that we want to do? And so I don't know that we've decided just yet. We're thinking about APHA and other, you know, the American Public Health Association, other public health associations will obviously put out sort of language and messaging about Black History Month, and we may do some um, posts on our Facebook page. There was maybe some thought about a proclamation or some kind of statement. Um, so I just wanted to raise that as something maybe for you all to think about um, as we also figure out what we're doing internally. Um, if anybody has any recommendations or thoughts about that, um, we could send them to Kiko or Meredith. And if you have a proposal for us, why don't you uh, bring that through Meredith and she can send it to us. How's that? That sounds great. I'll do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Cheryl, thanks for staying with us. <laughs> no, no problem. All right. Next on our agenda is to review our um, the, the um, model state tobacco regulation uh, recommendations. And so we got a lot of information and some confusing documents. Um, <laughs> so we have the a document that's called 2022 model regs, and that has some check boxes on that front page. And then we got one that was 2023. And it's a little confusing because there was nothing checked on the front of that one. Um, but I think uh, I reviewed this with Meredith and I think we're going to use the 2023 document. And what I did is I sort of checked off the boxes on that front page. So let me see if I can, uh, we can use that front page um, as sort of a, a way to frame our discussion, sort of take a topic, one topic at a time. Cynthia? Yes. Um, yeah, it. Joanne, can I just give a little yeah. background for yes, our yes, members? Yes, sure. as to, <laughs> um, so um, this is uh, this is really making the sausage, <laughs> Janet and Dallas. So um, what we've done up to this point has been a little bit different. And so um, just to let you know, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Sabar has been in the tobacco world work for many, many years. But um, just 25. to let you Oh, geez. Okay. Um, and Hi, reason, Janet. Yeah. I worked with her for yeah. the first 10 of them, maybe. <laughs> and the reason Cheryl's here is because she has so much history. And the reason we do what we do here is that um, Meredith reminded me today, we, we had regs in 2012, 2014, 2015, 2018, and 2020. So about every two years, um, what happens is the tobacco companies get smart and then people like Cheryl go to court 
and find out if we could just have tweaked our language a little bit, we wouldn't have lost so many cases. And so that's why Cheryl is here. And so as I think I'm gonna steal your word, Cheryl, this is a whack-a-mo game um, um, doing this kind of policy. Um, so we do it on a regular basis. It appears to be pretty tedious, but I think the way um, it's outlined tonight, what we're, our history in Northampton has been is that we're a little bit more um, aggressive in our tobacco regulations. Is that the right word, Cheryl? Um, yes, um, although the state law was much more comprehensive than we ever anticipated it would be. And when did that when did that state law get updated? That was just this fall. It was passed by it was signed by Governor Baker in November of 2019. It went into effect immediately as to the electronic nicotine delivery systems. The combustible pieces went into effect in June of 2020. Oh, I thought it was more recent than that. Well, so, COVID makes it seem much more recent because there wasn't a lot of activity um, when the law actually went into effect because no one was going yeah. into stores. Yeah. So just to give you that history, the state had a set of regulations, but we always had a stronger set in, in this community um, because we really take serious uh, the impact of tobacco on children. Um, but so now the state has kind of upped its game, but we want to make sure that our regulations reflect what this board, how, how we want to approach this particular issue. So I just wanted to give you that background. Suzanne's been here forever. She knows how we tweak these things. And um, it's, um, we have some opportunities to, tonight to do some different things. So um, just wanted to provide you with that because I know there were a lot of documents going back and forth. Um, but I think the latest, latest one you got that says yes and no and may not have colors on it. I think um, we can walk through that. So thank you for that time. Yeah, so Cheryl, Cheryl has been our guide and we often um, usually take her recommendations. I'm gonna share, let's try my share my screen again. Uh, So this is the 2023 um, sample regulations. And what I did is I answered these yes, no questions. Meredith put it in this format basically to say which things we already have in our regulations and which things we need to discuss. So if it says yes, that means we've already approved it and it's in our current local regs. And if it's no, that it's something we need to address whether we want to include it or how we want to include it. Um, so Meredith suggested that we go through this checklist. I thought we'd do that first and then we can go through the document. And I have colors on my document. I don't know if you do, but I have green and yellow, yellow being the state regs and green being the proposed local regs. But we can do that in a minute. Um, Joanne, I'm sorry, Joanne, yes. um, Meredith asked me to remind everyone that we are not voting on anything. We are just having a discussion about a direction and then um, we'll get a draft and then probably another draft. And so there's no votes tonight. That's the way I understand it, right, Joanne? Right. Yeah, so, so once we sort of have this discussion and sort of have a proposal of what we would want to include in our new regs, Meredith will put it all together and we'll have a draft document and we can discuss that and we're not actually going to vote on it until we have a hearing a uh, forum a public forum so we can get input from the public and that would be the time that we vote but we would probably want to come to a consensus on what we are interested in including in our proposal that go that gets presented to the public um does that sound right Cheryl? yes um, so let's go through these. Um, no permit renewal if there's an outstanding fine. Um, we already have that in our regs, um, unless someone has a problem with that. Um, I don't think we need to have any further discussion. Just stop me if you have a question. Um, no permit renewal if three sales to persons under 21. I believe we already have that in our regs. I need to, I don't think you do. Ah. Um, I thought we, but we can check on that. Okay. Number two. That's a relatively new strategy. Uh, do you have any comments on well, that? 
we had started going through this before. I'm, I can't see the top of this. Is this still say 2022 on it? This top of this one is the 2023. So it's slightly different. the last thing that got sent out? Yes. It just went with the agenda. But there were lots of documents. And, and at least on oh. my computer, they end up all over the page and I miss some of them. <laughs> it's but a little this confusing, is... but I, I do. I have, when we were started going over the same thing that said 2022 on the top, they really are the same. It did say it did say that we did we had discussed that we did have that number two. That's so, what Meredith has has yeah. said. Um, okay, it, it, so what I have for your twenty twenty two says you don't. But, okay, but that's we can I can just follow up with that. That's no big deal. Okay. Um. Well, let's talk about it. How do people feel about that? If there's three sales to persons under twenty one, which we think is sort of a a big a big no no. Um, do we not renew their permit? Does Cheryl, the state regs are 36 months. The Long state period. regs are 36 months. And what you would do before you would not renew a permit, you would have them in for a hearing to right. determine whether or not. But, but if our regs say that the, what do you call it? Tolling is tolling that, period. The tolling period. If there's that's no a question tolling, you're going to have to decide. Right. Because like in the case we just discussed, right. If the three times happened over a period of eight years, that's a very different thing to consider than if it happened over a period of 36 months. That's one of the issues that you need to think about. Do you want to keep, well, we're, we're jumping all over right now, but, but there are two potentials here. Number one, you could go with the state penalty and tolling period if you want for all of the sections that are in the state law. And you could continue doing what you do locally, which is no tolling period for those that are unique to Northampton. That's one approach. The other approach would be to get rid of tolling periods altogether and just go back to the beginning of time. And if you know there are three violations in 20 years or whatever, you could, you know, you, you could do it that way. It's it's really up to you how you want to do that. Do you have any, do you have a recommendation? Well, I mean, three years is a long time. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it, it would really be up to your, you and your staff. Um, do you have records that would go back? I mean, how long do your records go back? I don't know. You know, and, and how long do they go back for each retailer? Is it different? I I don't know. So. I've been asked this question once before, and now I think it's probably it was probably Lisa, my colleague from MMA, that asked it because of you. We don't have any municipalities that don't have any tolling period. In fact, most municipalities had either a 24 or a 36 month. Now they can the 24 months are invalid because they're less strict than the state. But again, you know, I, it's, it's up to you. You don't have, I mean, you could have, you know, a 48 month, you could have a four year instead of a three year. It, it, it's really your decision. Um, it, it's not frequent that we, well, we haven't seen no tolling period at all, but except in Northampton. I guess our goal was just not to continue to permit uh, recurrent offenders. Like, right. what's going to change? Well, it's that is why, and, and I checked your regulation does not have it. Um, your current regulation does not have it. But if someone sells three times within a three-year period, that's egregious. And you may want to revoke that permit, not suspend it, but revoke it. Um, there's another section in the new regulation that would say if there's any, if, if the board thinks any violations 
if, if you have four or more violations and they're egregious, then you may want to revoke it. I mean, it's there are two different sections that deal with revocations of permits. So it, it's, you know, you may just want to reconsider it, um, whether you want to do no time, li time limit at all, or you want to stay with what the state law says. Um, I'm looking at the proposed regulations here. In the case of four violations or repeated egregious violations of any section of the regulation deter as determined by the Board of Health and our, what we put in here is within a 36 month period, the board shall hold a hearing and after the hearing may permanently revoke the tobacco sales permit. What That's a pretty big your stick if you're gonna permanently revoke it. What do you consider egregious? Are there some things that are more egregious than others? Well, yeah. I mean, I think not having signs up is probably not egregious. I think selling to someone under the age of 21 um, is. once a year is pretty egregious. I think selling uh, flavored tobacco products is pretty egregious. And what And what we're seeing, what's happening now is that because the law is so strict, the state law is so strict, those stores that are tobacconists, you call them, we call them adult only retail tobacco stores, those stores now cannot sell flavored products. So the only advantage they have over a you know, regular convenience store is that they can sell high test liquid nicotine. That's it, they can't sell anything else. So what we're seeing across the state is we're seeing these stores um, needing to either change their business plan or they're selling illegal product because they can't survive as a smoke shop that can only sell, unless they're high-end tobacconists that sell, you know, and that have always sold, you know, high expensive cigars. Otherwise, the smaller tobacconists, their business plan is not, has been basically wiped out by the new state law. Cheryl, would we not have to define egregious, which sounds it's, like a complicated matter? Well, what you, egregious is one of those words that I would not have used, um, but for violations or repeated violations. So if, you know, we have some really, unfortunately, we have some stores that are selling out of the back windows, they're hiding their flavored tobacco products in microwaves, um, and taking them out when they know people that are coming in. They're selling um, tobacco that doesn't have any excise stamps on it or that has out of, have out of state excise stamps on them. The DOR is confiscating cases and cases of menthol tobacco. So I, I think it's egregious is, is really, it, it's hard when you see it, you know it. You know, when, when they've been reported to the Department of Revenue and um, you know, you're getting calls and complaints about them. You know, we, we caught a furniture store selling flavored tobacco products to the kids that knew to go to that furniture store after school. So it, it, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, and, and that's where the egregious piece comes in. So I would, it, I would, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Suzanne. I, I was gonna say, if we're at the point of um, contemplating um, withdrawal of a licensure, I think there would be substantial pushback if we had not defined egregious. Um, I hope we don't get there, but, and I, that all leads me to the fact that I think that we have, I go back to a wise person, Cheryl Sabaro, who once said earlier on this call, we're all about compliance. Compliance, right. It, it not being punitive. And I think that there's um, trying to get to compliance. And the other is confusing people who have to follow these regulations. And I think when we 
diverge from the state regs, especially updated state regs, we cause confusion, which does not help compliance. Correct. So, so by and large, unless there's something that, that really jumps out at me in this list, my perspective is to go with the new regs. Well, I think it's not really a question of going with the new regs. We have to take the state regs. No, I mean, not going any stricter. We've always gone stricter. So half of our statement has been uh, things other than, and at Cheryl's recommendation has have been items that have not been in the state reg. Um, so we've always done that. Um, can I jump in for a second? I know sure. that um, when we um, do adopt regulations and we go to the hearing and it, it passes that the plan would be to have like a really strong education plan to like get them there um, because it is confusing for them. They're still confused on no menthol. So we want to, you know, really um, do our best to, to get them there. And then I know I'm jumping because um, Cheryl said we, we're still up at like, I think number two, but um, Cynthia, when we talked to Meredith today and we talked about the first violation, it's the state says one and seven, she was clear on saying one and second violation, seven days and third violation, 30 days. She wanted to say fourth violation would be permit revocation. So that whether regardless of egregious, th that would be her step as far as um, like uh, the, the violations that then will match up, I think, with the fines. Well, and then you need to consider if you don't have a tolling period, it's four violations from the beginning of time. Yeah. And I think that's what Suzanne was getting at was saying we're about compliance, not about punishment. Right. If someone hasn't had an offense for 10 years and then ha has one that's technically a fourth offense, but they happened back in the 30s, um, do you really, it, does that, is that, are you getting compliance there or are you punishing? Right, right. Well, I think we would start fresh from these new regs. Um, so let me let me just tell you what Conquer did a couple of nights ago. Um, they did something that Suzanne has sort of suggested here. Um, they have asked me to draft a reg that just incorporates the state law, and that also has whatever is currently in existence in um, your own regulation, your own um, local strategies that are already in this reg. And that's what they wanted to do first. And they wanted to vote on that. And then, you know, a little bit, you know, further down the line, they would consider looking at other issues. And one of the reasons they wanted to do that is because right now, every retailer in Northampton has to comply with the state law, whether it's in your regulations or not. And Donna can attest to that and 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 the collaborative and um, Meredith you know there's there's been a lot of education a lot of outreach a lot of visits about what the state law says everyone's aware of what the state law says or should be because they've received written um, information emails and in-person visits so if you did just adopt the state incorporate the state sections into what you currently have, you could do that even without, you could do it by voting, but you wouldn't even need to hold a public hearing because you're not changing anything. You're just incorporating what is already the law and then ones that have been the law since 2020. That's one approach that's pretty simple. Um, the Although in your case, you would have to determine what you want to do with that tolling period. So I, I, I'm a little confused. Are you proposing that we keep our local regs and sort of mix in the state regs, which is what I'm like, saying like, that's an easy way to do it, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't incorporate some of the new strategies that we have. So, but it doesn't eliminate 
the strategies we've already put in place. It does not eliminate them uh, mm -hmm. at all, but it doesn't add some of the strategies um, like the density strategies that are out there now. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't. It doesn't incorporate them. You know, then you can do it the traditional way and just we'll look at all of this. We'll have a few working sessions. We'll go through it. Um, there aren't that many new strategies that are in here for you because you've adopted a lot of these already. So it's up to you how you want to do this. Um, and I know we're just on number two <laughs> now. Yeah, there's so much to discuss. Uh, it seems to me that the tolling period's really crucial. In, it is. In all of these, in all of- It is. I mean, shouldn't we start with that, knowing and making a decision about that? I think you. Sh I think that would be a prudent way to approach it, because that really colors everything. Right. If I can just jump in for one second, I want to reiterate something that Cheryl just brought up. Being a tobacco control officer with the Pine Valley Tobacco Control, we visit each and every store in, in Western Mass, uh, 29 towns, actually 31 towns now, um, uh, multiple times throughout the year. We're, we're not only educating, we're, we're visiting and, and doing price checks for the state. We're, we're bringing youth in to try and purchase tobacco. But the education part of it is the biggest part we do. And we spend a lot of time with the owners and the clerks, uh, any, anybody who's working at the store, answering questions, pointing out issues, uh, um, so some of the items that they're carrying that may be uh, uh, something they shouldn't have on their shelves, including still menthol and flavored items as, as, as they've known and, you know, in three years now. So it, we're repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating um, the, the, the same information over and over. Um, uh, so that egregious word comes in because I think mainly because, uh, you know, you, you, you still get after all this education over and over and over multiple times throughout the year, they still say, oh, I didn't know. Um, so it's hard to to really, you know, say, oh, OK, so, so how do we get that point across? Um, it, it's we, we spend a lot. We really do spend a lot of time with each and every one of them. Um, we give out our cards. We give them our personal numbers. Uh, you know, we're, we're constantly bringing in uh, guidance, you know, handouts, um, you know, any answering any questions they might have any anything at any time. Uh, if they have even a, you know, a, a vendor in the store saying you can buy these, go ahead, you know, you can carry these, don't worry about it. It's not in your state laws. They can call us and say, hey, before I purchase this, what do you think about this? Are they pulling the wool over our eyes? So, I mean, we, we really are out there giving them an, an abundance of education on, on, on where these laws are and, 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 and even their, their local laws, so. Thank you. So where to start? Um, well, I, I think Janet is, is on to something, but I think we can go through the checklist if you wanna share your screen again. Um, I think we if, if we if we just concentrate on these strategies and whether you have them or don't have them, um, I think that's a good idea. And is is that what this is? Is that how you circled these? Because normally when we circle these, we circle these as to this is what I like to include in the regulation. So, so this, yeah, no, this is. Um whether they're currently in our policy okay. or not. So I think number okay. two is, is written wrong, as you say, yes. that you think that's not um, currently in our policy. Number three is wrong and number four, number three is wrong also. Wrong. Well, we do have, have a, a we do have a cap, but we I guess we have a cap. cap. Yes. Yeah, we do, but the question was whether we wanted to modify that. Um, okay, well, you have a simple cap and you have the reducing cap. Okay. And I don't know, you have a different license for a tobacconist than you do for a retail tobacco store. We do. Yep. I don't know what the difference is because I don't see a difference in the capping, but we can look at it. But you do, you have a separate, you have a tobacconist establishment permit holder and a regular permit holder. 
Oh, it's not clear whether that includes both. The cap includes both. <laughs> no, the tobacco establishment is your definition of tobacconist, which is a store that doesn't allow anyone in who's under 21. So you have two different permits and then you have a permit holder. So you have a tobacconist permit holder and a permit holder. I'm not sure why you have two. Well, I, but I think the tobacconist used to be able to sell flavors, is that right? Yes, they did used to be able to sell flavors. Right. Uh, so but maybe, maybe that's why need... you, but so did the, well, so did the convenience stores, but I, that's all right. Well, we, we can work on, I, I don't know that you need two separate permits is what okay. I'm saying. Unless you wanna cap the number of tobacconists in the town versus the number of permit holders. It sounds like the new regulations cap Make it so strict that, yeah. There's no advantage to being a tobacconist anymore. Mm -hmm. Unless unless you're a high-end cigar shop and then you're always you've always been that. I think Meredith wanted to look at what what was our cap and then if we were under our cap could we reduce it to Absolutely, where, but where we were now. So say our cap is 20 and we only have 16 permits out there, let's reduce it to 16 and then we could we could always keep going if that's what we wanted to do but or we could stay there. I, I, yeah, what we norm, what the normal language bit. is, is that you set a cap and then the way you do it, you also have the advanced cap. So you would retire permits that were not, um, that were returned because the person doesn't sell tobacco anymore or they close the business and don't, you know, sell it to someone else who wants a convenience store. And then you put language in there that says, and the number of permits um, shall be reduced based on the number of permits that have been turned in. Right now, your reg says 29. Right. Uh, there, I remember discussion about um, the difficulty in reducing the cap upon a sale of a business. We've, cl we've cleaned that up okay. in the new language. It's much more clear. Yeah. This, is, this is why I advocate starting from the position of the new state regs. Yeah, but the so new much state regs, of course, up. doesn't, they don't address capping in the new state regs. So oh. we've cleaned up, um, the TA providers have cleaned up the language on the capping section that I think will make you very happy because it, okay. it, okay. it's much cleaner. And you clearly, I don't think you have 29 anymore, right? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, so you would start with whatever the current number is. We, we, I, at one of the meetings I was at, and I've only been to a few, we were, um, I think Meredith must have said that we have 24 currently. Okay, that would make sense. So we could start there and then decrease them as they get returned. It seems as though we have decreased that cap every single time we have revisited these regs. Yeah. Which is, which is great news. Which is great. That that's a success. Absolutely. But if a business is sold, they can still transfer that license. If, if the business, and this is a, a political decision, um, if the business is sold, let's say one convenience store is selling their entire business to a new owner. Okay, um, the new owner has the ability to capture that permit. Because when you're selling your business, you're selling your business with all the permits that you have. So Newburyport tried years ago to change that and say, once the business was sold, the permit gets retired and caught so much heat for it because the person who was selling their business had certain permits that allowed that business to operate. If they got rid of the tobacco sales permit, then that business wasn't as valuable as it was when it had the tobacco sales permit. So as much as we might want to say we can't refer it to a new owner, it just doesn't work politically. As long as it's a bona fide purchaser for value, you know, you don't want a sham sale. You want to make sure it's a real person who's coming in and buying it and someone's not just transferring it to their spouse or their child or something along those lines. 
I think our regs say that they can do that, but they have to reapply. Yes, um, we just clean the language up so that mm -hmm. it's much easier to make sense of. So can uh, do we uh, want to agree on that about reducing to whatever our current number is? Any comments on that? That's been our history and it's worked well for us. Yeah. Anybody else? You can't reduce it lower than what you currently have because right. then somebody has to turn in their permit for. Yeah, I think actually one year we did the number we had plus one or something like that. Yeah, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Any other comments about that? Um, recommendation uh, about no new permits within 500 feet of a school. We don't have that. Um, no, or we don't. permits within existing, uh, within a certain number of feet of an existing permit T. So um, those Meredith are density strategies. Right. Meredith thought we should hold off on uh, on those because um, looking at environmental justice considerations. Yeah. Um, it's a thought and, and it's a thought and what you usually will find and DPH can run this for you is when you look at where your sales permits are and you map it out, you'll see that they're normally clustered in EJ districts. Um, that's where you see the most permits, which is why there's the no new permit within X number of feet from an existing one to try to get to those clusters. But um, I get that. If you want to wait on those two, then wait on those two. Cheryl, am I understanding that the four and five are not in the new state state regs? Yes, those are local. Those are, those local. are local strategies. Okay. All the capping strategies are local. Okay. Um, so the things that we do currently have is the ban of smoking bars. It's not yep. in this regulation. It's in our indoor. It's in your secondhand smoke regulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Minimum cigar packaging. You have that. Pricing. Banning blunt wraps. We have that. You have that. Banning free distribution. Yep. We have that. You have that. You have the coupons. You have the self-service. Yeah. Um, you don't have an exemption for tobacconists, but I don't think you... I don't know. I mean, the reason we we added that exemption language is just because now that they that youth can't get into those stores, is there a rationale anymore for banning self service displays? Mm -hmm. That's a, a decision you can make. And with with some of these that you already have, we do have some better language, but it's the same regulation. Mm -hmm. So that's what's in highlighted in green in the rest of this document is sort of yeah the green line. are the local strategies mm -hmm. you know statewide the local strategies yellow are the ones that are in the state law so um uh number 12 you have educational in, in, institutions right um then the, the finding structure that's uh, the big one is a big one and the tolling period so yeah, the question 13 is, and 14. Do we want to align our finding structure to be the same as the state and basically um i think meredith's proposal is you take the state regs and our local regs and make them one document so that local stores have one document to look at it's all in one place and our finding structure would be at the end and it's the same as the state structure. So it's not so confusing. Like, you know, we were all confused with this last uh, hearing because is it a state reg or a local reg and, and all that stuff. So I think that's the proposal as we do what the state does. Does that sound right, Cheryl? Yeah, that's what, what many people are doing. Some municipalities like Medford, for instance, their board of health did not want to find someone a um, thousand dollars for a local penalty for a local violation because they were concerned that these fines are so high 
and most of their stores are mom and pop stores. So they wanted to separate them out because their board was very concerned about the high level of fines. Um, the other option, the, 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 the rationale behind unifying them is that it's really hard for a collaborative that has 31 different municipalities to know which are the local strategies versus the state strategies if they have they're working with an old regulation. Our new regulation, we have a, a, a program that we we divide them out so that it's very clear for your tobacco um, inspectors to see which are state and which are local. So those are the pros and cons of both of them. So the fining structure is not in the new state regs. Yes, it is. Oh, it is. So it we, is. The, the so fining we, structure for the violations of the state law are right. 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. Right. With de you determine the, the days of suspension, um, but it's 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. So that's for selling to someone under 21, not having the signage, selling flavored tobacco products, not having the manufacturer's letters. Um, it's, it's, it's for almost any, everything. Um, ban on free distribution, self-service out of package. Those are all state laws. Selling without a permit, um, the, having a high nicotine contact in electronic delivery systems. Most of the stuff um, is, is pursuant to the state law. The ones that wouldn't be are the sale of blunt wraps, um, a ban on smoking bars, that those are local, um, the regulation of cigars, having tobacco, tobacco sales in healthcare institutions and educational institutions, um, a requirement of displaying the mass DOR licenses, um, you know, violating the density minimums, um, those would be local. So the vast majority are state, and then there are like a dozen or so local penalties. It would seem to me having two different fining structures would be extraordinarily confusing to us going forward and to the people with these licenses. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what most people think. Are most municipalities keeping these documents separate or are they merging them into one? They're merging them. Janet? I, I guess I'm unclear about the idea of the two in terms of the fines with what you just said about, I think you said Medford. Yeah. Because doesn't Medford, like all of us have to, go, I mean, they might not, they might feel that it's too high a fine, but they still have to find. Oh yeah, they have to find at the 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, oh. except for the ones that I just talked about. For instance, well, right, they but... have a cigar packaging regulation that's not in the state law. So if you violate the cigar packaging regulation, you can get a hundred dollar fine because it's not part of the state law. Okay, but so did they keep it as two separate documents or not? No, nope. they put it in one document. Right. And then I can't share my screen right now, but then we have a list of which policies are subject to the state law fines right. and which are subject to the local regulation fines. So even though they thought policy. that a thousand is too, too much. They, they can't they can do, do anything do. about that. Okay. They, I just wanted to be clear about that. Yeah, except if it's just a local strategy, not right. a state one. And we put them in one document. You still are just going to have one document. You're just going to have two columns with which fines are state fines and which fines and, are just local. And is your organization willing to actually put that document together? We've already done it. I mean, for if us. You look at the, if you look at the draft, <laughs> If you look at the draft, Meredith sent you over a sample oh. template. Oh yeah, just scroll down and you'll see it. Um, it's so all the way combines, up to 13. Yeah, so this combines, so the, what's in green yeah. is keep going, keep local, yeah. and what's okay. yellow is mandatory is from the state. Yeah. So but keep, keep going, down. go, 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 all the way down to 13, <laughs> and you'll see how it's set up, Janet. The fines. Yes. 
I mean, it, it just so makes, here you go. Uh, next page. I mean, I so agree here's what we did. And we should have only one document. It, this sure. is one document. Yeah. But here it is. If you go with not unifying the fines, then you have a list that we we created this list. Obviously, that's all the state fines, which is the same for everyone. And then the local policies are going to be unique to Northampton, whatever Northampton has, which isn't hard for us to to take out. Right. So as long as we are, as long as we decide that we want to stick with all of what the state says and not go. Then we stronger. take out both of these columns. Right. The columns are there for those folks like Medford who want separate finding structures. Um, so now I'm confused again, because I thought what you're saying is we wouldn't have, we'd have the same finding structure for all the things that are under state reg. Yeah, but then yes. for additional things, we have to have our own finding structure because you don't have a finding structure for things that aren't in the state regs. No, I'm I'm making it more confusing than it needs to be. Um, you can have these fines have to be one thousand, two thousand, three thousand right. for those that are state. For those that are in your local regulation, you can either choose to make all the fines the same as the states or you have the legal authority to make your own violations 100, 200, 300 or whatever. You can do whatever you want with ones that, with violations that are not state violations. Right. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. And then we'd put it all on one document. You put it all, like this, you put right. it all on one document. And okay. then you will have, if you see, you know, we say for the violations of all sections specific to the North to Northampton, the fines are one, two, and one, two, and three, or whatever it is. And then there's a section that says for those that are state violations, the fines are this. And the state one is going to be above that, I think. I think it'll be in page 11 or something. Yes. And, and we specify here, if you go back down, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. If you go back down under the penalty section, you'll see violations. And then we have option one, which is to have state local distinctions between the fines. And then we have an option two, which is to um, have unified fines. Option two. Unified fines. And you don't need to make this decision tonight. You know, I can draft a regulation for you that has both of these options and you can decide, you know, when you're good and ready, what, what you want to do. You want me to go home, I'm sure. <laughs> or, just get, or just leave the meeting. So do you have a recommendation? So you said Medford is, is having their own well, I think it's much easier to just have a unified finding structure, especially since the vast majority of the regulations are going to be state violations anyway. But it's also, you know, you're increasing a fine from $100 for not selling cigars in the right packaging to 1000 So, you know, it's, it's unfortunately or fortunately for me, it's a decision that you you need to make. Can I ask Donna a question about that? Donna, as far as like writing up that order to correct cease and desist to stopping selling um, flavored tobacco and then defining both the state fines at a different price and then the local fines at their currently lower price, is that, does that make it more difficult or does it make sense? I don't know that it makes it more difficult as long as it's clear in the, in the regulation. On, on what the finding structure is yeah. and what falls under those, it, it's it's pretty it's pretty clear. Okay, yeah. that's why we did the columns so that an inspector would have the regulation and could see which is which. Where it gets tough is when you have different uh, communities, different municipalities that are doing different, different. things. So you just got to familiarize yourself with what they're doing um, and take a look at which them. is challenging. So that's where it gets yeah it is that's where it gets confusing. 
and the suspension periods we decide. Yeah, the state requires that they be not less than, or not, yeah, for a second offense, it's not less than one or more than seven, unless a municipality wants them to be higher. So they give a lot of leeway on, except for that first sale to someone under 21. So yeah, you can set them. I think Meredith talked about where it, first violation says one to seven. She was just thinking one and then second yeah. violation, seven. I, and, I think that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And the third, 30. Third, 30. And then fourth, she really was talking about- About know, bringing them in to see whether they want to revoke the permit. Yeah, yeah. And we have municipalities that have revoked permits, which has never happened before. We have uh, this non no tolling period, but I've been on this board, I don't know how many years it is now, 14, 15 years, we've never revoked one. Um, but we could have today, we could have in the hearing. Yeah, based on that one. So, yeah. I mean, it just shows how having a lack of a tolling period means you're, you could be giving different judgments to different establishments based on number of years or how closely they're clustered or whatever, which is a judgment call. It's cleaner if we just use a unified um, finding structure. Does anyone have any thoughts about the tolling period? Because our current regs say no tolling period, but it is pretty harsh. Um, any other thoughts on that? Has it ever gotten in the way of anything that we tried to do? I would have to, I think the way to, I'm wondering, and I don't know the answer to this, but I'm wondering if Northampton has actually looked at when someone violates the law, if they actually look at the previous offenses. I don't know. And I don't know if Donna would know. So I don't think she's, you've been doing this for a few years, right? Yeah, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing the uh, control of the TCO for about five years, but five not years. in Northampton. Um, yeah, I, so Northampton going back, I don't remember Meredith ever mentioning to me a, a revocation because someone had three offenses that went back. No, no, I, I don't I recall don't, that either. And I haven't, I, I've looked back at some of the violations that have happened in the city and I've never seen where that's ever happened. Yeah, so I, I don't know whether I, you- She has looked back like in this case, we did hear that there were two violations in the past. I don't know how far back they go. Mm -hmm. And I think moving forward, we if we did it, we would start fresh. Everyone would have to start fresh because it's all new. Um, but I guess that brings up the question is having no tolling period, is that fair? Well, and you're also, I think, going to have to look at what the violation actually is. Because selling to someone under 21 is a relatively new law. So are you gonna go, you probably could go back to someone under 18 with not too much resistance, but selling flavored tobacco products, that's, rel you did it in 2020. So there wasn't that law in effect 50 years ago. So would you, you know, I don't know how, I mean, you'd have to look at what the violation is and then, did, and, and years and years ago, the violation was just selling to someone under 18. There weren't all of these other, do you have a permit? Do you sell flavor? Do you sell e-cigarettes? They didn't exist. So the tolling period, I, someone could argue that, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't a second violation um, because I never, because it's a new law. I mean, it, it that could be argued. I mean, you can you can defend against that by say, look, but you've had violations for tobacco sales before. But I it, and so the other thing I can uh, mention too is that we also get notices from the state 
um, from the DOR and, do their own, yeah. and also FDA who go in and do their own. So they will let us know that they've had a sale. So it may not be us locally doing it. It may not be uh, the coalition doing it, but uh, we're getting notices that it's happening and elsewhere also there there are sales happening and as far as the tolling period when you know i do a lot of hearings in, in a lot of different towns and when the where the tolling period kind of comes into play is when uh, you know they have repeat offenders and they're trying to go back to see when the last sale was and when they have that tolling period in place it never fails they just missed it by a day or a week and they're like well we gotta we gotta throw that one out because we we're, we just passed that you know that 36 month mark and what about the fact that um, I think with this last one that we had, there was more than one violation. So are those count? Is it, I mean, you went in, Donna, at one time, but there were many right. violations. And some municipalities do that. They compile. So if you go in and you find multiple violations, they can say, here's number they one, stack here's number two, here's number three. Boom, you're already at that $5,000 right. mark. So, and then I'm you get up to eight. That. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Most municipalities don't stack them unless it's a really bad actor. But that's certainly up to you whether you want to stack them or not. It, the it sounds harsh what we're doing, but it also gives us a history, right? I mean, as opposed to the clock stopped and now we have a clean, that clean slate is, I don't know, it's a little bothersome to me. Just because- Well, you could also increase the tolling period if you want. Yeah, yeah. To five years or to 10 years. I'm just concerned with no tolling period at all. Okay. But you could certainly, you could be stricter than the state law and have a much longer tolling period if you want. In, in our local regs as they are now, is it is it may suspend and not shall? It shall. No, it shall. It, it is shall, okay. Because I was wondering why, maybe that's why we didn't have suspensions because we could make that discretion, but if, if it was shall, then... No, I we did that on purpose. As a result. Mm -hmm. So we gave an exemption to our own regs earlier this evening. Well, because the regs, the the violation was on the state regs and the state regs were new. Right. That was Meredith's recommendation. Yeah. That make that's what everyone has been doing. Okay. Shall and may could be very important if we don't have a tolling period. And we purposely yep. chose Shell because we didn't want to have the wiggle room to be swayed by one factor or another. Or, right. You know, we wanted to be make sure we were fair to everyone. That's why you have Shell. So I think um, the two issues that are still outstanding are the tolling period and the whether we're going to keep the state fines for everything or have our own fines. Yep, and you've already you've got the cap. We know we want to reduce the the core number, and then we want to clean up the language. Um, we're going to hold off on the buffer zone around schools and around new retailers. I don't know whether you want to increase the the price amount for the minimum cigar packaging. Oh, that we was a right. Yeah. yeah, we tied it to the consumer price index and it went up. Um, Cheryl, do if we specify a price, do we need to redo the regs every time we ch we change that price? You you would need to amend the reg because you're it's now a stricter, um, well but but you well it's tied to the consumer price index. Okay, well so you wouldn't need to because it says right in it it's tied to the consumer okay. price index. That's so that's, no, you wouldn't need to do that. You would just send a notice to all the retailers saying due to the CPI the prices are now this because they know it's tied to the consumer price index. That that's the. Um the adjustment that I was looking for. 
Yeah. Or else we have to have a new hearing. Every oh, time no, you change the cigar should. price. No, you don't have to do that. Even sure. though it's stricter, but you would want to send a letter out to them. Sure. All right, I think it's reasonable to include that. We're starting yeah. for doing that. Um, so tolling period, fining, suspensions, and revoking where we're stuck. Um, and it's just know, a draft, talk, right? You might want to talk more to um, Meredith about that and see what she thinks. Amy? Because I'm just not certain and again, she would know and Donna would know much better than I am whether you've run into cases where you've had to go back like 20 years and see what the violations have been. I just don't, do you know, Donna, whether you've... Yeah, the, um, I, we have had to go back 20 years, but I don't think we would be able to find that much history. That's what I'm, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're sort of saying even logistically, it doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah. Logistically, you should have some kind of cap on it. Right. But but every time someone has come to us, I just know, um, no matter who the, the inspector was, there always was a history. Like, it seems like we had the history. And, and I don't know if the filing system has changed or, or whatever, but. Well, you would have had the history for, let's see, how many in Dennis LaCourse did some of your inspections, yeah. right? Yeah. He would, he, you would, yeah. they, there would be records of that. Yeah. Um, before Dennis, I don't know. Well, well, let's put it, the tobacco control, the regulation started in about 1994. So I think that's when you, the, the, that's when the history probably, the history wouldn't go back before that, put it that way. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Most of our stores probably have new owners since then, but yeah, not all. True. So then you'd have to take that into consideration because the violation goes with the owner. Right. Can we, instead of saying amount of years, can we say going back, say, to 2010, like put a year on it? Sure. You can do and anything. So it, it'll keep getting longer as time goes on but it wouldn't be anything prior you to could you could do day. that for, for some reason and i don't know what it is um amy when you and i were meeting with meredith today she was no we, we're going to continue our current practice she was well then that's yeah. why i said you may want to talk yeah. to her because she, she's may have a reason yeah and she may have a strategy in a standard operating procedure for this that we just don't know. Yeah. I mean, as far as fines go, I would say, let's go with the state fines. They're higher, <laughs> you know, let's just go with that. They are, it is easier. Easier. I, I mean, I feel comfortable with that. But. With the unified, right? Yeah. yeah. That's mm -hmm. And then we'll take the lower end of the suspensions of one, seven and 30. Mm -hmm. And potentially the fourth as a, permit revocation. Mm -hmm. And we can take out the word egregious because Suzanne doesn't like it. Well, I just think- <laughs> I don't blame you. I, I, it, it's, if it's not defined, I think people can always protest it. And I, I would prefer it to be cleaner. You know, Suzanne, um, and that word came up again this afternoon when, when Amy and I were talking and um, to Meredith and, and Donna, you probably know this, that each inspector sort of has a sense of what's egregious or not. And, um, you know, and it's one of those gut level things <laughs> and to put a definition around it, it's situational, it's it is. contextual. It's, oh, I, I appreciate that. But if we're going to have the, our penalties yeah. based on, egregious and we yeah. haven't defined it i think that's problematic i totally agree with you it's just funny the word just keeps coming up 
Well, I guess the question is, you know, if someone's having a fourth violation and where, you know, can revoke their permit and their only violation is that they charge two fifty for a for a whatever, a cigar instead of two ninety, are we gonna feel good about that? Well, I believe the language for that for the egregious section <laughs> says may. may permanently revoke. So there's discretion there with the egregious piece. So if we're four violations of not having a sign or of selling a single cigar, you may revoke it. You don't have to revoke it. Mm -hmm. That's the only place where it says may. And what about like the signs, signage? The signage drives me crazy um, because not only, you know, the DPH, when they draft, when, when DPH drafted the regulations that accompany this law, they added an additional $50 fine for not having the signs. So it's technically a thousand dollars and a thousand fifty dollars if you don't have these signs, which we testified in opposition to that, but they left it in. When I say we, it was at the time it was, I testified in opposition to it and DJ did at the public council um, hearing, but they left it in. So, yeah. That... It seems silly to me, but again, what most inspectors do, and I'm sure Donna does it as well, if they don't have the signs, you go in and you bring them the sign. You don't fine them $1,000, $1,050. You just bring them the sign and they put it up. It's Don't you think, Donna, it's more like when you go in and you find menthol and you find right. this and you find no excise and then they don't have the signs. Then you right. then that. it's a, you're, yeah, it almost seems blatant that they're just right. like, you know, yeah, um, it, yeah I, I'm with Sarah, like it, it get the sign thing can drive you crazy. Um, you know, there's always a reason why they don't have them. Either they took them down to paint or they fell down. They needed a new one. It wore out. It's behind something. It's, you know, lottery comes in and covers it. So they try and peel it. It's gone. So there's, I, I go through signage. I think you know, the state, <laughs> wants to kill me for how much signage I go through, but I carry it with me every time I go out and I, 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 I hand them out like it's candy. So <laughs> it's um, one of those things, you know, you just, you just got to keep giving them to them. So, you, so basically you wouldn't cite someone for just that you would just give them a sign. No, I would give them a sign. And and we always put it in their notes, you know, when we're educating and, you know, when we're putting it into post or putting it in our reports, we do say delivered signage delivered signage so you can always go back and look and see that history is there mm -hmm. you know if you were trying to come up with um you know uh where do we go with this if you're having a hearing where do we go with this you can look at the history and see you know and kind of use some of that to, to your advantage to say okay we've been in your store 18 <laughs> times in the last three years and we've given you signs 15 of those 18 times what gives you know so even though we don't have discretion, you know, our regs will say shall fine or shall whatever, you have a lot of discretion in what you present to us, right? What's education and what's what you cite. So that's where the discretion comes in. Right. And, and municipalities are different. Some municipalities will say, hey, we just want you to go in, give them that education. If you find things, let us know. But we're not out handing out tickets and, and saying, okay, you're, you know, we got you again, we got you again. We're educating, educating, giving them the, the tools they need. Um, and then, you know, the, the municipalities take it from there. Oh, how do you keep it straight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and do you have municipalities that will tell you that even when it comes to selling to underage, they don't want you to give, they don't want you to fine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't do it there. It's up to them. They, they actually make the decision on whether the fine's going to happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I have been to many towns. There, there are a few towns out here in Western Mass that um, have pulled permits. Just that's it. They're you know they've had more than more than two or three sales to uh, uh, underage. They, they there's no questioning. It, it's in their regs and they pull it. They don't. They don't even discuss it. It's a third hit and it's done. Yeah. 
it sends a pretty strong message to the other to the other establishments in their in their towns. I mean, it, it does. You know, the, the news spreads like wildfire. They talk to each other, so um, yeah. it's 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 strict, but it, it, it's it's the way they chose to write their right. That's the end of a business. Yeah, sure. And it's it so depends on the municipality, I guess, and how they feel about it, because then other ones will say, don't even find them. Right. Does the finding, uh, do you know this, Cheryl, does the fine, the fee, does it go into the general fund? of the? It goes into the general fund unless you set up a special fund, a revolving fund for tobacco. And I don't think you've done that in Northampton. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd set up a special fund, like maybe for education, or it would go back to the department. You would set up a fund that would help you, um, that would give you more resources to use in to, your tobacco okay. work. But most of the, if you don't have a special fund set up, it goes into the general fund okay. for the city. All right. I sounds like we need more time to talk about fines and um, suspensions and tolling period. And I can start working on the draft and I can speak with Meredith and um, she can tell me why. Well, and you guys can also tell me why she feels strongly that she doesn't want a tolling period. Okay. There's some, some reason, I'm sure. Um, I can't say why. I just know that as a group in the past, we wanted to be generally strict and didn't want repeat offenders to just continue business as usual, pay a fine and keep doing it. Right. Um, but logistically, keeping records, it sounds like we really want to make sure that we do it right. Um, we need more information about that. Any other comments? I think we could probably finish this discussion now and know that um, uh, Cheryl and Meredith would make up a draft and then we'll just continue the discussion again. Um, yeah. But I just have something to, to work from. Great. Not well, a one thing. Um, is the, one of the other um, forms that uh, Meredith sent you, I know she sent you many, so they're a bit confusing. She did send one that was highlighted in yellow and green that uh, we had done. Um, comparing our regulations to the state regulations. And a lot of the highlighted yellow are the things that uh, really just changes the language of what's yeah. in our, yeah, our, our, our regulations right now. So it's not necessarily adding anything, it's just changing the language. And that's yeah, really that's, important to know because uh, it's, really it's important to read. clearer. Yeah, because we, we run into a lot of, you know, what really is a flavor and what really is an enhancer and what really is a blunt wrap? What really- And what is a is manufacturer of letter? Right, right. So it just clarifies, you know, what 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 that means. You know, we're we're constantly telling them what it is and explaining to them what it is. But uh, you know, when you go back and you read the regulation, it's it's really not clear. So it sounds like the state regs have helped clean up our language quite a bit. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you, Cheryl and Donna. Thank you so much for your thank you. guidance. Thank you. And it's a, it's a complicated subject for sure. Um, <laughs> sure is. <laughs> we'll take it up again. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you, Cheryl. Bye-bye. All right. Um, any closing thoughts about, um, about this topic? We'll discuss it again. You know, we can take as much time as we want uh, to get it right before we have a public forum on it. Um, the only urgency is the fact that we now have state regs and our own local regs that are different. We have no tolling period. There's these two different sets of fines and it's sort of complicated to manage for us uh, if there's violation between now and when we finalize our regs. So um, it'd be good to get it together soon any other thoughts about that well, the only other question i have is that i noticed a gas station speedway closed so they must have been selling tobacco they weren't no i think it had more to do with their um, gas pumps it required a lot of upgrading in the the financial oh. cost to that 
Yeah, I didn't, it wasn't why as much as if there was another license available. So, yeah. okay. That, is that the one on Route 10? Uh, uh, King, King Street. Street. McDonald's. King, King Street. Street. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dallas? What happens in the, just like you said, Joanne, what happens in the interim while we're deciding this? Do we just defer to state regs at this point, like we did today because the citation was under state regs, if there is a violation? I think if there's a violation of state regs, we have to do what the state says. And if there's a violation of local regs, we use our current policy. Okay. I think so. It really I depends so. what they're cited for. As long as it's stricter. As long as it's stricter, you said? As long as ours are stricter than the state's, we can go with ours. Yeah. Okay. We can't be more lenient than the state. Yeah, yes. if ours are above and beyond, then we do that. But if they didn't um, violate a state reg, they don't have to have the state penalty. I, yeah. I think that's, I think I that's, that's right. how I understand it. Yeah. All right, so we, it's to be continued next time. Uh, shall we do minutes? Did everyone have a chance to look at minutes? Um, November minutes, do you want me to bring them up? Anybody have any comments about them? Let's see if I can. I have a couple. Uh, let me see if I can find them. I thought I had them here. One second. One second. It's my share screen. It's covering up my share screen. Okay. There. Is that it? See that? Okay. Suzanne? Um, new business, first paragraph. Um, I think it would be very helpful if after, in the second line, if after COVID wastewater, if it said virus concentration mm -hmm. rather than just wastewater. Um, that is true also for the December minutes. Um, Okay. Okay. And also in that paragraph, I think it would be very helpful if the sentence about flu, Elliot reported that seven cases of flu, if that came as at the at the end, because the following two uh two <laughs> sentences are about COVID again. Yeah. Um, okay. And then um, discussion of future board under new business third paragraph. Um, there, um, the last sentence, Commissioner O. Co that should be Commissioner O'Leary. I didn't even notice that. Suggested having a consultant. Mm -hmm. And that's what what I have. I this is just a suggestion. This doesn't have to be done. But as I was looking through the department updates, it seemed to me that it would be much easier to read if the department update dates were bulleted, mm -hmm. because this is a paragraph of a lot of unrelated mm -hmm. topics. So just mm -hmm. not to choose, not to change anything, but it, for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's it. Okay. Anybody else? No. I'll do the bullets. Yeah. Does anybody want to make a motion? I make a motion to accept the minutes. Second. With edits? With the edits, yes. Uh, any other discussion? And all in favor, Dallas? 
Yep. Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. And December. Let's see if I can find December minutes. Okay. Anybody? Suzanne, did you have you had something else? Yeah, I have. I have a just a couple uh, data updates. Uh, three uh, Roman numeral three. Um, the second, the second, there is was increase. <laughs> I, I think it should. The is should probably go. And well, then there should be an and there. No. And then also the next line is the wastewater virus concentration again. Yeah. All right, anything else? Spelling. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, old business. Um, fix the spelling of concentration. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, old business, Roman numeral five. Um, Dr. Levin. Cheryl Sabaro unable to, and that the state had just released new model regulations. That's it. All right. Anybody else? Um, if you go up to uh, Jim's variety, I think there's an apostrophe after Jim and Jim's. Another grammar snob. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> And I can't recall, so I don't know, but I can't recall if Councilor Maiori also talked about gender affirming care or if that was brought up by myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know if there's an edit there necessarily. I think that was brought up by you and she thought that that might be included in her work. Did she say that? I just know as a res result of this, Elliot had created a separate web page on the city's website for gender affirming care, but I cannot recall if that was included in this discussion. Mm -hmm. We did talk about putting uh, information on the website. Um, and that is up now, by the way. Right. Should I put that in here? That the city with information about Reproductive health care and gender affirming care will be put on the city website. Or was on our website, wasn't it? Uh, it's on the uh, city Northampton MA.gov. Oh, it is. Okay, great. The link to it for gender affirming care. And then on the sidebar, there's also abortion reproductive health care. That's not look right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. I might actually, sorry. Uh, I might go back up and uh, put information about abortion and reproductive health care or just reproductive health care and strike women's. Okay. Anything else? 
Great. Anybody want to make a motion? I motion to approve the minutes as edited. Second. Any other discussion? <clears throat> All in favor? Uh, Dallas? Yes. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. I think uh, the last thing to, uh, we were going to go over the calendar. Um, so Janet, you had some conflicts. I do. I, it was travel that was planned before I had the meeting yeah. dates for both, unfortunately, both February and March. I'm not expecting you to change the meeting unless it's a problematic for others as well. But um, that's it for the year. <laughs> I can't find that document. I asked Meredith was going to send it out, but I don't think she sent it to me. Does anybody else have it? No, but I have a conflict in July. So I guess that brings up the question which has come up before if someone has a conflict, do we try to move the date? Or if only one person has a conflict, we keep the date. I mean, we certainly want to have a quorum. And it's certainly helpful for a lot of us and, and Meredith's office and, and uh, to have some regularity and predictability um, and for the public as well. Um, how would you like to handle that? I don't think you should move it for one person because you'll still have a quorum. Mm -hmm. It becomes very complicated to find another date that we all uh, can agree upon. Do we, we have a full board now, right? Yes. It makes sense now that we have a full board and a schedule for the year that we would all be able to plan out for the entire year mm -hmm. right. regularly. Right. Yeah. I would agree not to change it. Um, so if someone can't come, they should let me know, because then if I hear from two people, then, then maybe we would consider changing it. A quorum is three, right? So we need at least three. Mm -hmm. I guess we could go forward with three, although we wouldn't necessarily feel good about voting when almost half of us are gone, but um, it's, it would be legal. Um, um, so I think if one person's out, we'll keep it the same. If two people are out, we could put out a notice and see, see if there's an easy fix that, uh, and if there isn't, then we leave it. And if three people are out, we can't really have the meeting. Um, all right, so our next um, scheduled meeting is February 16th. So right now everyone can come except for Janet. And we'll talk a lot more about tobacco. <laughs> um, okay, anything else 